three. And here we go, and yes. <laughs> Then the applause. How's everybody doing today? Thanks for coming. All right, fantastic. We are in week seven. This is the last full week of activity that we have before we get to the final exam portion of this class. So I'd like to uh, congratulate everybody for doing a jo good job and. Uh, and, and coming this, this, this summer. We've had a, done a great job with attendance, performance. I can't say enough good things about you. Those of you students who maybe just walked in, if y'all could make sure to check with me after class to make sure I get you down on the attendance sheet. Brian, Torrance, Maya, all of you folks. I've already mentioned you, uh, Mariana. Okay, fantastic, couple of quick announcements. Uh, writing assignment five uh, has been graded. Uh, you've got the feedback, and you need to turn that in uh, sometime this week before Sunday. Uh, writing assignment six, I am going to pull an all-nighter or spend 24 hours. I've got like 60 of these things to grade. They will be graded tomorrow, whether or not it, it, if it kills me, okay? I will have writing assignment five and six back to you. Now, you are allowed to edit them and turn them in to me Sunday at midnight. However, Sunday at midnight is the last time you can turn in and edit. So I would suggest if you think the second revision might not make snuff, then you need to turn it in early. Does that make sense, Arian? Turn it in on Thursday. I'm going to be all week long, I'm going to be combing through the to grade box, grading stuff, and I'm going to be getting stuff back to you within six to eight hours so that you can react to it. Does that make sense? Okay, um, I'm also going to lock all homework assignments um, will be closed for editing on my, uh, Sunday night. So if homework assignment number two, is it a 65 or an 85 percent? I need you to finish that up, okay? I'm, uh, I'm not going to have you talking to me two days after grades have been turned in going, hey, Chris, I just edited that homework. I have to pick an arbitrary time, and Sunday night is that arbitrary time. Okay, uh, now check this out. Class will be fully online this Wednesday. Just like I've let you come online a few times this semester, I'm going to take the return favor this Thursday I'm not going to be here. Now, that means you don't have to be here either. What we're going to do is we're going to meet completely online as a class. I'm not going to be here. You're not going to be here. I expect you to log in at 1.30, just like a uh, regular on the live broadcast. And I want you to type something like, hello, hi, Chris, let me know you are here. We're going to do that this Wednesday. Is that cool? Okay, also, uh, I didn't write that down here, but there are no optional webinars this week. This week's collaboration assignment is to do the official course evaluation for this class and send me that confirmation. This is actually kind of important to me. Uh, my boss likes for us to have at least 75% of our students do course evaluations every semester. I make it a personal point of pride to reach 95% every semester. So I'm counting on each and every one of you to do your course evaluation this week. I sent around a video, I can resend it, showing you how to do it. Did anybody watch my video where I showed you how to do the course evaluation? Did it work? It did work, okay, fantastic. I can send that around if anybody wants instructions on how to get to the course evaluation. Um, but I really would appreciate you doing that. And this is probably a good time for me to say that not only are you the smartest class I've ever seen, but you're also the best looking, okay? <laughs> okay, right. So I really wish you folks would do that for me. Um, just a little point of competition. I've got a bunch of online students and I've got a bunch of seated students. And right now the online students are crushing the seated students in response rate. Okay, so those of you folks in here, do not let, see these people in here, you folks online are crushing them. 
Don't let them do that to you. Go ahead and turn those course evaluations in today if you can, just as quickly as possible. Okay, uh, one final note. Let's go to the uh, Blackboard course. And for those of you online, you should now see my screen. If you look at the Blackboard course, you'll notice that we have module eight up here at the top. That's what we're doing this week. And you'll notice right below that is the final exam folder. So when you ask me where uh, will I find the final exam, it will be right in that folder that is now available to you in Blackboard. If you click in that folder, what you're going to see, actually my seated students see this because I'm working on the exam in the seated class, uh, but you'll notice you'll see the final exam. It's going to be right here. It says not available yet, not available yet. Um, it will be available uh, Monday morning at 6 a.m. Now, I always get in a hurry and try to do things just a little bit quicker, and sometimes I don't need to. I realized that I had the exam window closing Tuesday night at midnight. You know what? I could actually give you till Wednesday night at midnight and not uh, kill myself. So I've decided to expand the test window from Monday morning at 6 a.m. until Wednesday evening at 11.59. Now my grades are due uh, lunchtime by Thursday, so I'm going to be freaking out Thursday morning. So it's going to be very important that you have finished your exams at the appropriate level, 80, 90, 95%, depending upon the grade you hope to achieve in this class. All right. Any questions? Holy cow, a lot of questions. Good afternoon, Connor. Good afternoon, Elizabeth. Good to see you. We have Luisa in the house. Mahika is here. Uh, Olivia Downing is here. Hi, how are you doing? Weevil. Oh, Landon Housel. Hauser, okay, fantastic. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, no, maybe so. Ariane, yes. So the final exam, I think that's unlimited attempts on it, the homework, right? Unlimited attempts, yes. And how, how long is it? How long is it? Yeah. Oh, wow, wow. I could tell you, but I'd probably be guessing at this point. Oh, um, yeah, okay, I'm thinking it's going to be it covers 15 chapters. I'm thinking it would be cool to have at least seven questions per chapter. So I'm thinking somewhere between 75 and 100 questions. The longer a test is, the better it is for you. Uh, some, well, the more reliable the test is. You probably don't care one way or the other. Does that sound about right or would you like fewer questions? Yes, no. More questions or fewer questions? A hundred questions or fifty <laughs> questions? hundred questions or fifty questions? Yeah. Fifty questions. Okay, I'm gonna do a hundred questions in. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. All right. Yeah. It'll be somewhere between fifty and a hundred questions is what it was. It'll be multiple choice, matching, true, for, false, the standard ones you've been using. Some of the questions you will have seen this semester. Wink wink. All right, uh, so if you want to go back and look at your homeworks, that would be helpful. And some of the questions you may not have seen this semester, okay? And I will be available, of course, uh, for consult by text or Microsoft Teams through the entire exam process. Start early, try often, and contact me if you need help. Yes, bazitsky has got a question. Uh, I'm going to... Maybe none, maybe none. Because like I said, you, if I'm gonna give you till Wednesday night at midnight to finish the exam, I can't be grading 140 items on Thursday. Fair enough? Okay, fewer questions. Ashika says fewer questions. You know, Ashika, if you'd asked me in person, I would have said yes, but since you're not here, oh God, I don't know. All right, so let's go ahead and get started this week. Let's see. Oh dear, oh dear. Oh, okay, we are all right. Okay, fantastic. So this week we're talking about uh, psychological disorders and I chose the name uh, uh, The Sociopath Next Door. Now, I, 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 uh, I thought about the, the choice for this week's, the title for this week's lecture. I don't want you to, I didn't want to stigmatize psychological disorders, okay? However, what I do want to suggest to you 
is that you, as a capstone project, think about reading a book. Now, one of the most interesting books that I've read recently is one called The Sociopath Next Door. That's why I chose this title. It's a great capstone project for this class. In fact, I wanted to assign it, and I probably will in the fall make students do it to get an A in this class. But it's a very readable book. It's a great introduction to psychology, to clinical psychology specifically. And the neat thing is, is as it tries to describe what, a soci what the antisocial personality is, it goes through and talks about the different pillars of psychology, the theoretical traditions. How can we think about sociopaths from a cognitive perspective. Let's talk about nature and nurture. They talk about those forces. They talk about biology and genetics. All of the things that we've talked about in the, uh, this semester with regard to uh, psychological and human functioning are woven into a really interesting book uh, that provides a great introduction to personality disorders that's very, very uh, readable. And uh, the neat thing is uh, you may even discover that you know a couple of sociopaths or that you've run across them in your life. Because what she's talking about is people who don't have a conscience. You don't have to be a killer to be a sociopath. You just have to uh, have difficulty feeling bad about the things you do. And some of us are like that. So I think that would be a great capstone project for those of you uh, 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 to, to, uh, who are interested in reading to do. Great readable book, please try it. And if you like it, I'm more than happy I'm more than happy to give you other recommendations, but this is like the easy way into the field of scientific psychology. If I give you another book, it would probably turn you off. This one's going to be really interesting. That's why it's a little more sexy, if you will, the sociopath next door. I, I know it's a car crash, but that's what people are interested in. I figured I'd get you in the door. All right, now uh, let's talk about diagnosing psychological disorders. And before we go on, uh, what I'd like to do is I would like for you folks to watch a video. I'm going to play it up here for you folks to look at, and I'm sending it to uh, you folks at home right now in the chat bar. Let's see. So it's in the chat bar. You folks should see it. I'll see you folks in about two and a half minutes. Let's watch this and then talk about it. All right, I'll send them to there. I'll go here. And you folks need to watch this guy. All right, this is a mailman. Yeah, I, I hit a button. I've got hotkeys set up, so I screwed up my broadcast. No, I mean the mailman. Oh, yeah, him too. Now, this is not edited video. This is a two and a half minute shot. I swear it's not over yet. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, then let's come back to uh, me. Actually, let's go back to this one right here. Okay, if you would come back to me. Um, now, that may have seemed uh, funny to, to some. It, there was a certain sort of humor at it, about it. It's sad. Um, here's my question. Although uh, they, it had a title that said OCD, but nobody knows if this guy was that. But what I want to know is, was, is, does, is that guy, does he have a psychological problem? What's wrong with that person? Is there something wrong with that person? Can you tell from that behavior? Yes or no? Just, just okay, there we go. Mariana's going to take a guess. She's going to say yes. That was upset, upsetting, Louisa. It absolutely was upsetting. But okay, so that, why? Here's the question. What was disordered about that behavior? What now? Right, okay, okay, okay. We're not sure. That seemed pointless, right? Illogical. It seemed out of the ordinary, would you say? It definitely seemed out of the ordinary. What else characterized that behavior? Yeah. Um, it kind of seemed like he was just having a hard time getting the box to fit in there properly. That was my interpretation of it. Okay, right, right. And what was he, well, you mean he couldn't get it in there at all or he wanted it in there a certain way? Yeah, maybe, I don't know. Do you think this fellow has trouble in his job? You say yes, Mariana, why? Mm hmm right so Mariana is saying that he uh, he has probably has trouble doing his job if he takes that long to visit every mailbox he probably can't get his job done I'll bet you his boss gives him a hard time because John you're not getting enough done today right absolutely now do you think this guy suffers from some sort of negative emotional feeling? Do you think something's causing him to feel in such a way that maybe he's not, he's uncomfortable? Do you think this guy is comfortable in life? It's hard to like make that kind of judgment. Judgment like off of one video. Okay, right, okay. Oh, okay, 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 fantastic, right. All right, so here's the deal. Uh, like, like William brings up, uh, like Torrance brings up, there are a million different ways to behave in this crazy, complex world. What looks strange to you might be completely normal to me. What looks crazy in this culture might work in this culture. How people deal with life, there's so much variation in the way people live that it's really hard to figure out who has a psychological problem. The, uh, here's the, the thing though, as, as a clinical psychologist, my job to a certain degree is to figure out who needs my help and who doesn't need my help. So when we think of what a psychological disorder is, we don't start out with the label, you're OCD, you're schizophrenic, you're what? We don't start out with the label and then say you have a problem. We actually say, hey, is this person having trouble functioning in the world in which the the, they exist. So in the beginning of the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistic Manual, the professional manual for psychological disorders, they say that you can think of psychological disorders as any behavioral syndrome, any thought syndrome, any feeling syndrome that sort of has these basic characteristics. Sometimes behavior will be so out of the cultural norm that we will think it is actually a, uh, a psychological disorder. 
I don't know if you know this, but back in the 1950s, if you had the nerve to be homosexual, you were considered as having a psychological disorder because that behavior, that orientation was so far outside of cultural expectations until 1973, right? So sometimes behaviors are just so different like that guy's behavior you might not do that that behavior might look different odd and what we're not in different from what we expect right now here's the thing uh is any behavior or thought or feeling is it maladaptive does it prevent you from doing your job are you claustrophobic and you can't get in a car and go to work are you agoraphobic you can't come to school because there are other people there right um, does it cause the person individual distress? Most people go to a clinical psychologist because they're bothered. People, happy people, don't wander into a clinical psychologist's office. Most of the time, people seek treatment when they're, we think that the natural state is to feel good about yourself, to feel okay. When people uh, have situations that really make them feel distressed, and then uh, sometimes people's behavior causes discomfort or danger to others. Uh, if you read The Sociopath Next Door, what you're gonna find is that these sociopaths are perfectly happy and high functioning and uh, willing to do what is socially acceptable, but their behavior is bad for us. So we consider that. So when you look at all of the different behaviors out there, if somebody ever asks you the question, what does it mean to have a psychological disorder? That's a tough thing. And the, the, the cultural definition of what it means to have a psychological disorder depends based upon culture, situation, um, and all kinds of different things. So it's hard to have a concrete uh, answer for that. Now, uh, the uh, treatment of di disorder diagnosis has a long history. You may or may not know, but way back in the day in the 1400s, uh, they had a diagnostic book uh, for helping people with psychological disorders. It was called the Malleus Maleficarum, the uh, Hammer of Witches. And basically it was thought that people who suffer from psychological disorders uh, had, um, had some sort of possession, magical forces outside the body, uh, tend, we thought control people's behavior. In fact, if you wanted to know if an animal's been killed by witchcraft here on page 162, what you would do is you go to the place where the dead animals and skinned, drag its intestines along the ground up through their house, not into the house through the front door, but through the back door into the kitchen. You throw it into the fireplace, and if it was killed by a witch, uh, the witch's intestines will start to burn. This is, this is sort of psychological diagnosis and theory from the 1400s. Your book's even gonna talk about it. Now, what we typically talk about today is this thing called the DSM. It's also a book for diagnosing diagnosing people who uh, are having, uh, who, who we think need help. Now, what you're gonna notice is if you look in this book, um, it, it was created after World War II, and it's basically a handbook that lists all of the different kinds of psychological disorders that you could possibly have. They're listed in cat by chapter and category sections. So we have a section on neurodevelopmental disorders, things that happen to children when they're young. We have a chapter on schizophrenia, people who have some sort of psychosis. We have a chapter on depressive disorders, all the different ways you can be depressed. We have a chapter on bipolar disorders, all the way in which you can uh, be bipolar. In fact, you know what I could actually you can sort of look at this right here. Oh, pull this back up. And so you're gonna notice all these chapters. And when you go through these, it's gonna talk about each of these things. So the oppositional defiant disorder, and it's gonna list all the categories right here. And then it's gonna list the diagnostic features, how you can diagnose. It's gonna tell you how often it occurs. It's gonna tell you what happens when it occurs. It's going to tell you what kind of risk factors are associated with this disorder. It's going to talk about differential diagnosis. And so the DSM is, in a sense, it is a reference manual. It's a reference manual 
that allows you, uh, psychologists, to diagnose psychological disorders. Now, it includes three things. The first part is a set of instructions on how to use the manual. And one of the things that it says in the first section is don't you, you, ever buy one of these and use it because it is for professionals only. I have a friend who has one of these. She's an English professor and she loves to self-diagnose and go. she's always going to clinical psychologists and I think she needs to quit reading this book because she's not a professional. If you read this, you can find yourself on every page, right? All right. So, uh, it's a, it tells you how to use the book. And then the rest of the book is going to be chapters related to each and every disorder. And there are families of disorders. There are disorders characterized by too much anxiety. There are disorders characterized by mood problems. There are disorders characterized by, uh, because they just happen to children. So we have all these different families of disorders. And it's gonna be listed in those. And then in the back of the book, what they do is they talk about the ways in which they might change the book in the next edition. As I suggested to you, until 1973, uh, being homosexual was considered a psychological disorder. In the first edition in 1955, it was. In the second edition in, uh, that came out in the 60s, it still was. And then researchers uh, spent time talking about it and in the third edition, uh, it was taken out of the DSM as a psychological disorder. The same thing happened to Asperger's and autistic uh, autism. Has anybody ever heard of Asperger's disorder? Okay, Asperger's used to be seen as sort of similar to autism. Uh, in the DSM-4, the last version of this book, Asperger's was a disorder. In DSM-5, it's not a disorder anymore. And if you look in DSM-4, they're talking about why they might change the book in the fifth edition. So this is a desk reference. This is a desk reference and also a clinical tool. Your clinical psychologist knows two or three chapters like the back of their hand. You're a psychologist that handles anxiety disorders. You've got the anxiety and mood disorders chapters. You know them cold. Maybe you're a therapist that works with uh, personality disorders. You've got the personality disorders chapters cold. And each psych clinical psychologist is going to specialize in sort of a different area of treatment, just like medical doctors do, right? And this is a research book and a clinical handbook. Now, there's also a book called the ICD, and that was developed uh, internationally at the same time. That's more of a clinical handbook, and it's also going to include physical diseases as well as psychological diseases. I don't know if any of you folks have gone to the doctor for a medical problem recently, but when you get billed, if you look at every bill you get, every procedure you get has a three or four digit number followed by initials and points. And what that represents is chapter and verse, there's some book which describes what physical malady that is and why the doctor uh, believes you have it. And it's used for billing purposes. They do the same thing in the DSM. Each of these disorders is going to have a number. For example, uh, let's see. Uh, whoa, hello. Hello. We don't want to do that one. Not appropriate for class. Get to a different chapter. Okay. Uh, the, the diagnostic disorder for trichotillomania. Did you know that there are some people who compulsively pull hair out of their head? It's called trichotillomania. Um, and it's 312.39. Uh, if you go to your clinical psychologist and they diagnose that, when they send a bill to your insurance company, they have to write down that particular number, right? And so uh, it's sort of used as a de desk reference, right? Now, the DSM uses the, uh, uses the uh, medical model. Uh, and what you're going to notice is that when you go to your clinical psychologist, just like you go to your medical doctor, they're going to process paperwork the same way. They're going to diagnose you using the same sort of practical styles. 
Basically, what clinical psychologists realized in the 40s was, hey, those medical doctors do a really good job at diagnosing and treating people with, with physical disorders. And psychology wanted to achieve the same degree of quality. And so they adopted this idea of the medical model. And so they talk about things like diagnostic criteria. Each, each disorder in this book has diagnostic criteria, things that you must do in order to have that disorder. For example, there are nine diagnostic criteria for depression. Um, you have to have five of them for a two week period to be diagnosed as depressed. Okay, so there are diagnostic criteria. Now, uh, just like if you go into the doctor and you, you fell and your arm is hurt and we want to figure out if you sprained your elbow or whether or not you broke your elbow. Knowing whether or not you sprained or broke your elbow is what they call in the medical field a differential diagnosis, right? And it's really important. Did you break your arm? I put it in a cast. Did you sprain it? I do some other sort of treatment for you. Same thing with psychological disorders. What they're going to do in this book is they're going to tell you, well, depression sometimes looks like this and it sometimes looks like this. Uh, and it's if you want to try to figure out when the person is depressed as opposed to when they have uh, anxiety, this is going to tell you how to look to differentiate between those two disorders, a differential diagnosis. We're going to talk about uh, also the DSM is going to include incidence information. Incidents, how often this disorder occurs. Now you might say, who cares how often it occurs? Um, but you know what? Tracking how often a disease occurs allows us uh, as medical professionals, as psychological professionals, how to respond to challenges in the environment. Did you know uh, that dep rates of depression and anxiety and, uh, uh, and uh, I forget what the ticking behavior absolutely exploded in young teenage girls right after the introduction of TikTok. Over the course of two years, the incidence rates of these uh, ticking, nervous ticking disorders jumped by about 20%. Um, and because we were keeping track of the incidence rate, somebody pointed out the alarm, hey, something's going on here. Nobody knows exactly why it happened, but bizarrely enough, this be behavior that only happened in young teenage girls suddenly exploded right after the introduction of TikTok. Yeah. Are those spelled the same tick and TikTok? Uh huh. Are they? No, 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 no. I'm not sure where TikTok comes from, but a tick is a sort of repetitive, ritualistic kind of behavior. Uh, somebody, if somebody wants to Google it right now, uh, I'd be more than happy to see that. Um, okay, so we have the incidence rates um, and then etiology. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that today if I have time. Etiology, we have to know what causes a behavior in order to fix it. And over the course of this semester, we've been talking about etiology. When we talked about behaviorism, we talked about how you learn things. You can learn psychological disorders. When we talked about cognitive psychology, uh, we were talking about uh, patterns of thought and cognitive behavioral therapy. We think some people have maladjusted uh, thought patterns, habits of thinking that cause them disorders. We've been talking about brain areas and neurotransmitters. We think that brain areas and neurotransmitters sometimes contribute to psychological disorders. So in each chapter, they're going to tell you what the basic belief is about what causes this particular disorder, right? And then you're going to know the prognosis in the developmental course. What's going to happen to this disorder with and without treatment. Did you know that people who have schizophrenia, there are typically three basic patterns of schizophrenia. Some people will have a schizophrenic episode, get better, never happen, and nothing will ever happen again. It'll just be that one time in their life. Other uh, schizophrenics, they'll go in, they'll have a schizophrenic break, and then their functioning will go back to normal, but from time to time, they'll have schizophrenic episodes. And then about half of all schizophrenics are what we call chronics. Once they uh, uh, slip into schizophrenia, they never 
really get better. So we want to know what happens to these disorders. Do they get better on their own? Do they get better with treatment? What does a pattern look like? And all of this is designed to help us understand more and treat psychological disorders. Um, now, I will tell you uh, that it seems like uh, we are not as successful as we would like to be. TikTok is a reference to the time you spend on the app. I did not know that. TikTok, so it's a short amount of time. TikTok, TikTok, it's over. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, this is Noah saying this, believe him or not. I'm not sure. Okay, here are the diagnostic categories. Again, for your interest. Now, uh, we do think that some of these disorders are uh, caused by biological uh, explanations. And so uh, your book's going to talk a little bit about the obsessive compulsive disorders. Obsessive compulsive disorders are sort of a nervous related and neurotic related disorder in which people's feelings cause them to engage in ritualistic aimless behaviors that help uh, manage these feelings of anxiety. Uh, your book talks about OCD, so obsessive thoughts cause anxiety, which leads a person to engage in a compulsive behavior. Hand washing, um, locking the door multiple times, uh, putting the, uh, 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 the, the, the thing in the mailbox 150 times, that's sort of a, a compulsive behavior. Then there are people who have anxiety about their looks that cause them to engage in compulsive behavior modification activities. Did you know there are some people who even uh, self-mutilate because they think that a part of their body doesn't belong to them? There are doctors, it, they talk about it in medical uh, circles, the idea of selective amputation. There are some people who feel like a body part of theirs doesn't belong to them and they want it off. Now you as the doctor may say, I'm not cutting off a perfectly good part because that's malpractice. Yes, but what if that patient then goes and tries to smash off their own hand by running a car over it and dies, right? So there actually are people, your idea of who you are as a human being, your, if you wanna call your body integrity, is uh, something that exists in your conscious awareness. I think I have a hand. I know I have one, but I also think I have one too. Sometimes people's uh, beliefs about their body don't match up with their actual body, right? And then there are hoarding disorders, which is where people are driven by this compulsive desire not to get rid of anything that they might need later, right? Now, uh, if you look, what they've done is they've used imaging studies, uh, PET scans, to try and locate different areas of the brain that are hyperactive in these people. And this evidence has been used to suggest that these areas are responsible for these particular disorders. So in your book, they're gonna talk about these obsessive compulsive disorders and where they can be located in the frontal cortex. Now, I'm gonna ask you to look at the picture right up here and the evidence that is used to support this is as grainy and is semi sort of vague as this. Do you see these? I, I think these are uh, fMRI scans right up here. And what they do is they compare a normal person, a control, to somebody who has the psychological disorder. And you see which part of that person with the psychological disorder brain uh, works harder or doesn't work as hard. And so what they think is that these compulsion related disorders are somehow front brain events, front brain events, all right? Now, another thing that you're gonna see in the DSM uh, that also relates to the biology, the nature part of the organization, is this idea of uh, 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 genetics and the idea of uh, 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 this, this idea of whether or not a, a behavior is, um, is genetic. Right, And so uh, what, what they do is they do behavioral genetic studies. So the average incidence rate in schizophrenia, I think is about 1%. One in 100 people is gonna have a schizophrenic episode, right? And so 
if a uh, torrent has schizophrenia, the next 100 people that walk in the door, only one of them is going to have schizophrenia. That's the incidence rate. So comparing him to somebody who has no genetic similarity to the incidence rate's about 1%. But what you're gonna find is as we start comparing family members who are more and more similar to Torrance, we're going to see that as they get genetically more similar, they're more likely to have schizophrenia as well, which suggests to us, if you will, a genetic component. And if you look in these books, you're gonna notice that some of these disorders have a stronger genetic component than do other disorders, right? Um, now, uh, your book's also gonna talk, so with schizophrenia, 1% of the population, it's more common in men than in women. And here's the crazy thing. Schizophrenia tends to occur earlier in males than it does in females. And schizophrenia starts in the late teens to early 20s, a little bit earlier for males than for females. Now, here's what I'm going to ask you. If it's genetic, if it's genetic and it's in your genes, why doesn't it occur earlier? Schizophrenia never occurs in early childhood. I, I mean, there may be one or two case studies, but by and large, it doesn't occur in early childhood. How can it be genetic and not occur when you're born? If it's genetic, why, why, don't, why, don't, why aren't you born with it? Does anybody have an idea? Yeah, Arian. Ah, okay, okay, right, right, right. That's a great way. I, I like exactly what he says. Uh, I don't see anybody online at, uh, answering. Yeah, that's great. So the idea is there may be a genetic component, but what if it's an interaction between the genes and the environment? And uh, that uh, theory has been proposed. They call it typically the diathesis stress model. And what you'll see is they say, that people uh, in their life, they may either have a genetic predisposition or maybe some early childhood trauma. Remember a couple weeks ago, Nadine Burke Harris and ACEs? What they suggest is that, like Arian says, you have either a genetic predisposition or some sort of neurological deficit. And then what happens is for some people, uh, when stressors occur, when stress occurs in your life, that weakness is finally exposed. So uh, most of us start dealing with stress for the first time as teenagers. That's when life starts to suck. You know what I mean? People like me, people don't like me, I have friends. I, you know what I mean? That's when all that crazy social stress and you start becoming your own person. You're not my parent's child, I'm my own person at school. And what they suggest is that maybe it's that stress right there, the stress of growing up and the genetic predisposition or the trauma. And this is sometimes known as the diathesis stress model. It's actually been shown, and your book talks about it, it's been shown in the development of depressive episodes. And what they talk about um, is this gene called the 5-HTTLPR gene. And what they suggest is that children with the short gene uh, have a genetic predisposition to depression. Coupled with trauma early in life, what you get is an explosion in uh, depressive symptoms. So what they're arguing is there's a genetic tendency, combine that with early childhood trauma, and this genetic tendency explodes. Now, if you don't have the uh, HTTP LR5 gene, uh, the, the right version of it, then it doesn't matter if you have trauma. Some kids uh, aren't, uh, uh, you know, have bad childhoods and grow up okay. Some children have bad childhoods and they don't. The idea here is that maybe it's some sort of epigenetic interaction between your genes and your environment. And here I also list for your interest the nine symptoms of, uh, of uh, depression, feeling sad, empty, hopeless, and worthless, uh, fatigue or loss of energy, loss in pleasurable activities, 
uh, uh, let's see, significant weight loss, difficulty sleeping or sleeping too much, uh, uh, difficulty focusing, psychomotor agitation, which is just being fidgety, okay, um, and suicidal ideation. Those are the nine symptoms. If you have five of those for two weeks, you've had what we would call a major depressive episode. On the other hand, some people don't have all five of those episode uh, 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 qualities. They'll have three, but they'll have them over six months. If you have uh, that, you actually get, I think it's called persistent depressive disorder, PDD, which is Oh, okay, okay, there you go. And so the diagnosis will depend upon the pattern of the symptoms uh, for depression. Uh, research has demonstrated a gene environment link for the major depressive uh, disorder. Okay, uh, finally, 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 conditioning, uh, da, 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 personality disorders. Uh, you know, we're running close on time, so I will talk a little bit about personality disorders. Yes, ma'am? Dr. Singh, I have a query. Under DSM, do they issue how to diagnose? Do they issue how to undiagnose? You know what I mean? Like, once you have a disorder, can you not have a disorder or something? Ooh, ooh, Al, that is a very challenging thing uh, to say right there. One of the problems, one, if there are critics of psychiatry, and they may be right, one of the problems with uh, psychiatry is that when people are given diagnosis, there's sort of this social label that never seems to come off. How many of you broke an arm? Anybody in here broke a bone before in their life? Okay. Do you walk around telling people that I'm, I'm broken bone, recovered, I'm in remission? No, we fixed it, right? The problem with psychological disorders is that there's not a biological thing that we can point to. I can't say your depression gland is too big. I can't say you have an anxiety knot. Since we don't see those biological things, um, it's hard to know really when they, it's hard to know when people have them and it's hard to know when they go away. One of the problems with psych clinical psychology is that a lot of times when people are diagnosed, they're never undiagnosed. That's actually a brilliant, brilliant point to, to, to mention. Wow. You know, it's kind of interesting. I'll go to this so I can talk to the students at home. A famous study, and here's the deal. I'm not a clinical psychologist, okay? I do not have a professional opinion. If you have a clinical psychologist you are in a relationship with, uh, or a friend who's a clinical psychologist and they tell you different, listen to them, okay? I am not an expert, so please don't go tell your clinical psychologist, Dr. Roddenberry said, blah, blah. I'm an introductory community college teacher, okay? Please don't take my, for your psychological health, don't take my, my, my interest. However, uh, there was a very famous study done in the 1970s uh, and uh, the paper was published called On Being Sane in an Insane Place. And what this clinical psychologist did, named David Rosenhan, On Being Sane in an Insane Place, check it out. He took five of his, I think it was five of his graduate students, maybe more. He took them down to a, a clinical psychologist, had, their, had them given mental health evaluations. He found himself some very healthy, healthy, healthy graduate students. And he told them, hey, I want you to try to infiltrate the local psychiatric institutions. You're going to go to an intake office and you're going to tell them, hey, I'm hearing voices. And these voices say dull, empty, and thud. That's your only symptom. Go in and see if you can get admitted to a psychiatric institution. Once you get in, try to get out, as, lose the symptom, and see how quickly you can get back out. And what he found was that every last one of these healthy students was incorrectly diagnosed as being schizophrenic. They were all put in uh, and taken into the psychiatric institution and they stayed on average 11 days. And none of them were, they were all diagnosed as psychiatric in remission, remission. And what they found is that everything they did was interpreted by the doctors 
as if they were in sane and schizophrenic. So when they asked a normal question, they got an irrational answer based upon the fact that the doctor believed they didn't know uh, what to ask. And they found that, here's the crazy part, the other patients immediately knew, hey, you don't belong here. There's nothing wrong with you. The crazy thing is the other patients knew that this person didn't belong in the psychiatric unit, but the psychiatrist didn't seem to know that and didn't really interact with the patients at all. Now, uh, they all got out. David Rosenhan published this paper on being sane in an insane place and it caused a furor, right? Every clinical psychologist in the world was absolutely mad. And a lot of them were saying, oh yeah, well that would never happen at my institution. So he picked out three of his detractors and he challenged them. He said, guess what? In the next six months, I'm coming to your hospital. See if you can catch me. Now, he goes back six months later and he says, all right, how many people do you think were trying to infiltrate? How many people do you think were faking their symptoms? And he got numbers that were in the 10 to 11% range. 11% of the people are trying to fake. Guess how many people he sent? Zero. Zero. You bring a very good point. Uh, again, I'm not a clinical psychologist, so I'm not allowed to say that. I just think that it's very difficult to diagnose something that doesn't have a physiological correlate, like a broken bone or a blood sugar test for uh, diabetes or something like that. Great point. Wow. Okay. Who well, class is over? She just ruined clinical psychology for us, folks. <laughs> now, she's quite right, though. Um, and you know, I'm actually going to show you on Monday when we get on Wednesday before we start class, I'm going to send you a video about psychiatric treatments from the early 20th century. And what you're going to find is that the things we were using to treat psychological disorders in the 30 were somewhere between laughable and cruel and ridiculous. And what I want to argue is that I'm not sure how much farther we've come. You know what I mean? I hate to say that, but I don't know if you heard the serotonin hypothesis just went in the garbage. Did you hear that? The idea was that people, well, you know what? Every psychological disorder has a, uh, has, has a neurotransmitter hypothesis. There's the dopamine hypothesis for schizophrenia. Um, it's related to Parkinson's, we think. Uh, there's serotonin, acetylcholine for depression, uh, GABA for anxiety disorders. We have all of these neurotransmitter theories. If the serotonin one doesn't work, what do we think about these others, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Personality theories. Okay, we are, okay, real quick. Uh, personality disorders. Uh, having a personality is a wonderful thing. The more exciting your personality is, the more people will love you. And in fact, some of the biggest stars have awesome personalities. It's cool for people to notice you and to see that you're a unique person. However, some people's personalities are so extreme, so rigid, and so, uh, and so uh, 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 destructive that it makes it makes it hard for them to exist in a social world. Your personality is fine until it makes it hard for you to get around, along with the rest of the world. There is no such thing as this is the right personality, but we know that there are some personality styles which make it difficult to fit in with the rest of the world. If you have this kind of personality style, it developed early in your childhood and isn't explained by another type of psychological disorder or some sort of biological problem with your brain, you might be diagnosed with a personality disorder. And there are three broad problems we see in people's personalities. Some people have personalities that are so odd, eccentric, and just out there that it makes it hard for them to fit in in the world, okay? Um, so there are some people who have what we might call a paranoid personality. 
Uh, if you've ever met somebody who's like super duper paranoid, sometimes they do things that are a little bit odd and freaky that turn people off and nobody wants to be around them. Um, then there are personalities that are characterized by too much or inappropriate kinds of emotion. If you've ever been around somebody that does nothing but throw tantrums and fits all day, every day is their personality style. That gets a little bit annoying at this, after a while. Some people do not have any empathy and no sympathy and no guilt. That's an emotion. Those people are called sociopaths, antisocial personality disorders. It's normal to be a little bit ashamed of the stuff you do. If you don't have a sense of shame, you can do some horrible things. So that's a second cluster. And then there are some people whose personalities are just so anxious that it makes it hard for them to fit into the world. Those are the three broad clusters. Now what you'll notice up here is we've got underneath those three broad clusters, there are specific kinds of personality disorders. I'm not gonna waste my time talking about them because uh, one of the big debates that they have in the back of the DSM is what personality traits should we use? How many should we have? Are there eight, are there nine, are there 10? Uh, which should the ones be? Um, what you'll notice is that people don't usually have one of these 10 styles. They'll usually have two or three of these styles together. So it makes it really hard to sort of individually say you are histrionic and you are uh, 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 avoidant, you know what I mean? So really think of base people's personality styles as being three broad categories. Some people are just so odd that they don't fit in. Some people are so anxious that they don't fit in. Some people's emotional functioning doesn't allow them to fit in. Now, one of the interesting things I think, uh, people are very interested in sociopathy. Sociopaths destroy the world. They steal, they kill, they hurt us all, right? Sociopathy is probably one of the most interesting and important uh, of the personality disorders. That's why I suggested you the book at the beginning of the class, The Sociopath Next Door. Now, there are people who believe that you can tie sociopathy to brain functioning. It turns out there's a part in your brain, we didn't really talk about it, uh, called the reticular activating system. And you like to be aroused. You like a certain amount of arousal. But you don't want to be too aroused. First, most of us robbing a bank would terrify us. We'd be so scared because that's bad, right? But some people need that kind of excitement just to feel normal. And so uh, this dangerous few is a 55 minute documentary uh, based upon some psychologist belief that sociopathy can be identified in people's brain functioning as early as three or four years, and that there are predictive factors that can tell us who we need to intervene with to maybe stop sociopathic behavior. And one of the interesting questions it brings up is, do we really know enough that we should start labeling four-year-olds as being sociopaths or not? However, if you watch this video, it's kind of shocking because they do have a child that started microwaving animals at four years of age, uh, which is a fairly sociopathic thing, in my opinion. Um, and if you want to watch a shocking video, uh, I suggest you take a look at this. Okay, let's see, it is 2.28. Uh, we've still got, I can't believe we've still got 12 students on here. That's always impressive. I'm always shocked when people stay for the whole lecture. Maybe it's because you think you have to, and you do. Um, okay. Uh, I'm done. That's all I have to say today. Remember uh, Wednesday's class, log in online because I will be in Biloxi, okay? I'm going home, yeehaw, to see, uh, to see the homeland. Where? Mississippi. Uh. <laughs> I, I don't have any friends there. I'm just going down the south. I'm actually from around that area, so I'll be down there. It'll be like 175,000 degrees, I think. Hopefully I'll get some some seafood. Y'all take care. It's good to see everybody. Oh, yes. Let me get attendance real quick. Hold on. Let me see. Goodbye. Goodbye, folks. Have a great day. I will see you in class on Wednesday. Thanks to those of you who came online. Yeah. Do that. And we're going to see.